Thank you, Sherry, for leading us in worship there. Uh, Infant lowly, infant holy reminds us of what we talked about this morning, uh, the humanity of Christ, but also the divinity of Christ. And he is the one that we worship during this Christmas season and the one that we are looking forward to celebrating his coming and anticipating his coming again. But he's also the one whose message we are committed to taking to the rest of the world. And so for us as Southern Baptists, it, is, uh, it, is, it has become customary uh, for us to use the Christmas season to think about international missions uh, with our Lottie Moon Christmas offering. And I want to encourage you to be praying about what the Lord would have you give to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. If you are uh, not familiar with our particular tradition within the Southern Baptist denomination and don't know that name, um, Lottie Moon was a missionary uh, that really encouraged Southern Baptists to be on mission internationally. Uh, she served in China, gave her life to missions, and uh, we have now uh, named our missions offering in her honor. And so 100% of the, uh, the, the mission offering that is received through Lottie Moon is given to international missions. And, uh, and tonight, I want us to spend some time talking about international missions, and in particular, Missions to those who are very, very hard to reach, uh, oftentimes through unreached people groups. And so we're going we're gonna to talk about what is involved with us going on mission and sending others on mission. Uh, one of the things that uh, kind of spurred this conversation in my mind over the last couple of weeks was the news uh, about a missionary named John Chow. How many are, you, are familiar with his story, at least a little bit? Um, uh, from, from all accounts that we can gather, uh, uh, sometime on November the 17th of this year, uh, he was killed uh, as he was trying to share the gospel with a, a native tribe on the island of North Sentinel, uh, right outside of, not, not right outside of India, off the coast of India in the Indian Ocean. Uh, I tried to give you a map that would show you where this place was, but in order to blow up the map enough to have the North Sentinelese Island show up on the map, you couldn't see India. Uh, it was, it's, a, it's a long way off of the Indian coast. Uh, it, is a, it is not only a hard-to-reach people, it is, it is completely an unreached people group and has been for, uh, for, for a long, long, long time. And I think it was Thanksgiving afternoon that I saw on Twitter uh, just a little bit about his death and about uh, how those circumstances came about. And it wasn't much longer that I began to see things on Twitter, uh, just reaction from, from different sides, uh, some that were very positive. In fact, uh, one, of the, one of the natural ties with uh, John Chow and his story is the way it kind of points us back to what happened with Jim Elliott. Uh, many of you know his story very well, that he and, and four other men uh, set out to reach the Iuka tribe uh, off the coast of Ecuador back in 1956. And uh, they were seeking to do much of what John Chow was seeking to do among the North Sentinelese people. And, uh, and they too were killed in the process of that. So for Christians, when we heard this news, uh, we, we think of stories like Jim Elliott, and we think of sacrifice, and we think of commitment uh, but then as you begin to, to listen to and hear and read some of the things uh, that were shown in the, the more secular media, uh, it became fairly obvious fairly quickly that this was a story that we needed to know more about before we made any judgments. Uh, and I think more than that, it is a story that I, that I think we can learn from. I think it's one that we can be reminded of the high cost of missions and, uh, and, and take an opportunity to consider that. Um, Ed Stetzer, who writes for Christianity Today, uh, you, you'll see his name a couple of times uh, in this particular discussion. And uh, sometimes you'll notice that the, the tagline under his name says Christianity Today, in which he is writing to a Christian audience and he's trying to help us uh, reflect on how this affects our mission and how we are to understand mission among indigenous people. And then sometimes you'll see that the tagline, instead of saying Christianity Today, says Washington Post, uh, because he also writes for many secular newspapers and, and magazines and blogs and websites. And so um, he 
he does a really good job of trying to bridge the gap between the church world and the secular world. Well, he, he shared in Christianity Today that John Chow's death made world news and sparked mostly negative and antagonistic reactions toward the idea of missions in general and Chow in particular. Now, you might read that and that might be a total surprise to you. You may be stunned by the fact that uh, here the, the death of a missionary could, could lead to antagonistic reactions uh, from the secular media. Uh, J.D. Payne, who uh, organizes a podcast uh, called Strike the Match, in which he is uh, dedicated to telling the story of missions, um, he said the secular media is not too keen on things happening in the body of Christ, especially when it comes to issues related to unreached people groups. Uh, so if you didn't read any of these stories, some of the reaction was uh, with the understanding or the assumption that John Chow was uh, totally oblivious to what his presence on the island, uh, how it may have affected the, the natives who were already there. Uh, I saw one interview in particular in which uh, someone was outraged that he would bring diseases to their island. And uh, certainly there was a report. Uh, and I think that the general understanding of this situation has been that he was going to an island uh, onto which uh, visitors were strictly prohibited. How many of you have heard that? That it was illegal for outsiders uh, to visit that island. Uh, we're going to talk about some of those things uh, tonight and, and uh, get a little bit more of the story and hopefully learn a great deal about how we can approach uh, international missions and, and missions to hard people. But one of the things that we need to understand from the very beginning is that going on mission and being on mission, being a missional people is controversial. Um, it may not be controversial in the church, but it is certainly controversial in the world. And uh, speaking of the differences between um, Jim Elliott and John Chow, Stetzer says there are certainly differences between Elliott and Chow, but what has really changed is our culture. Uh, the, the, the reaction that a secular world around us has to the idea of, of taking the gospel and, and inviting change by indigenous people. Uh, Stetzer says people are more negative about missions, partly because of mistakes missionaries have made, such as colonialism, a lack of cultural awareness, and more. And uh, he said in his Christianity Today article, we must realize that the very notion of conversionary Protestantism is offensive to many in the Western world. This idea that, that we have something that you need and we're going to sell it to you, basically. That's the way the, that's the, way the secular world around us sees that. And it's very controversial. Uh, they, they see the church as being arrogant uh, as a result of that, that, that we're trying to... Uh, force people to come into uh, to our particular molds. Uh, he goes on to say, for many, missions is a story of heroes and gospel advance. And uh, it certainly is for us. We like to celebrate that story. Um, if you don't know, I, I like to spend Wednesday nights uh, between Thanksgiving and Christmas celebrating that story and looking at the lives of missionaries who have gone before us and learning from them and being challenged by them and inspired by them. And this year I'm doing that with the life of David Brainerd, uh, who also was uh, a missionary to Native Indians, not on some faraway uh, island out in the middle of the ocean, but, but right here in America back in the, the 1700s. And so if you, uh, if you are free Wednesday night and can join me for that Bible study, we'll look a little bit more at the life of David Brainerd. But so for many like us, missions is a story of heroes and gospel advance. But for others, missions is a story of colonialism, genocide, triumphalism, and cross-cultural co cross disasters. Uh, now here's one of the things that we need to remember as we embark uh, on, on any kind of mission. Uh, Stetzer said that Christians worldwide genuinely believe that people who hear and respond to the gospel are better off when they do. Now, this is a, this is a theological test for us uh, because one of the things that I have discovered is that if we don't have a right view of the necessity of Jesus in people's lives, 
we probably will not have a right view into world missions. Um, I, I can't tell you how many times I have sat with people, talked with people, interacted with people either personally or on social media about the idea about that guy who's sitting on the tip of Africa or that guy who's, who's on a remote island out in the middle of nowhere and, and how is this person going to be judged eternally? Uh, when this person uh, stands before the Heavenly Father, because let's face it, the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews that it is appointed unto men to die once and then to face judgment. And so we often think not about our own selves and the judgment that we will face and making sure that our house is in order, but we're often thinking about, well, what about that guy on the tip of Africa? What about that guy on a deserted island who has never heard the name of Jesus? And the thinking goes a little bit like this. Surely a loving God would not hold anyone responsible for a message they have not heard. Have you heard that thought? I won't won't ask you to raise your hand, but have you had that thought? It's It's a very understandable question. And that's why uh, it is good for us to reiterate to ourselves on a very regular basis what Jesus said. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. Now, we can have debates about logical conclusions. We can have debates about limited access. We can have discussions Uh, about those people, but I'll tell you what, we would be safe if we would just side with Jesus. And Jesus said that he is the only way. There is no other name under heaven by which men can be saved. And if we understand that, then we will genuinely believe that people who hear the gospel are better off when they do. Let me tell you the, the flip side of that. If we don't think that people will be held responsible for a message they have never heard, logically, people would be better off if they never hear the message. I hope you understand that that is the logical conclusion of that thought process. And so if that's true, we ought to shut down our mission efforts because we would not want to bring anybody under the responsibility of hearing the message about Jesus, but that is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that Jesus is our only hope. Whether you're living in America and you have the opportunity to pass a church on every corner or you're living on the tip of Africa, Jesus is our only hope. And so we have to get that message to those who have never heard. That's that's why a church like ours takes the entire month of December to raise money for international missions. This is why we send mission teams to different parts of the world because we believe that people are desperately lost without Jesus. And they will genuinely, uh, if they will hear and respond to the gospel message, then they will be better off. So going back to this idea that, uh, that missions is controversial and this idea that John Chow was going on to an island uh, where he was not allowed to be. Uh, an island that was uh, the, where it was illegal for outsiders to visit that island. Um, through a, a few interviews with a couple of different ladies who are attached to the mission organization um, through which John Chow went to this island, a, a missionary organization called All Nations, uh, Ed Stetzer and others have had opportunities to sit down with a few of the leaders of all nations and clarify some of the things. And, that, and one of those things is that John Chow uh, was under the understanding that the, the ban against outsiders visiting the island had been lifted. In fact, here is an article from the India Times back on August the 8th. Uh, This is one of many different places that you can read this from Indian sources. Uh, This article says, Indian government has decided to remove restricted area permit from 29 islands in Andaman. That's the area that we're talking about for foreigners. And it went on to say, now people from the other countries can also visit. And it listed a host of other island nations and right in the middle of that list was North Sentinel Island. They can visit it 
without any permit. So the initial stories was uh, the initial stories were that he was visiting uh, an island where outsiders were banned and were not supposed to travel. But he was under the impression, as it seems to be the case, that the the Indian government has opened that up. Uh, another one of the um, objections to him going, as I said earlier, was that he might be bringing disease. Uh, to these islanders who have been completely isolated from the rest of culture uh, for years and years and years, uh, if not uh, decades. And uh, through, through speaking with those ladies involved with, um, with the, or the missions organization and also Ed Stetzer had the opportunity to talk with some of his, uh, his, his college associates and those who do missions with him. And uh, they, they said Chow was not unaware of potential health risks his presence could pose to the tribe and planned his trip accordingly. Uh, So the initial reports that we heard of this Cavalier trip where a guy basically just uh, hired some locals to put him on a canoe and uh, row him out to this deserted island so he could uh, just very willy-nilly share the gospel with the tribal people, uh, that is not the case. Uh, we, we, We have since found out that he has received multiple vaccinations and intentionally quarantined himself for many days prior to his multi-day trip to the island. What we've learned over the past uh, week or so since this uh, news began to become public is this was, this was not a rash decision by John Chow. It was one that has been in planning for months, if not years. Uh, those multiple vaccinations... Uh, the Pam Arlen says that he received uh, over 13 different vaccinations for things that he might have uh, introduced to the tribal people and uh, did everything he could to prepare himself for that. But it doesn't change the fact that we need to understand that going on mission is controversial. Um, we get excited about it here at Utica, and, and, and we should, and we will continue to. But the world around us will not always be excited about that. And even on a local basis, uh, there, there might be some things that we do on a local basis where we are excited about making a difference and we won't always be met with that same excitement. I, I pray that's not the case uh, at the Mill Village. We've done, we've done preparatory work to go in there and, and meet people who are in there and we're looking to meet needs there. But we have to know that if we are on mission for the Lord, there are going to be times that people do not agree with us that they don't understand what we're doing and they don't agree with our mission. Going on mission is controversial. Going on mission is complicated. There are many, many, many issues that our missionaries have to deal with. I I would say that evangelism in general is complicated, Uh, but you do it in an international context, it gets even more complicated. Would you agree with that, Miss Karen? It's a little bit harder a little bit harder than just going across the street and sharing the gospel with our neighbors and our coworkers. Uh, Dr. Pam Arland, who is on the international leadership team with uh, the All Nations Missions Organization, she said this, John knew it was dangerous, of course, and he attempted several different ways to give gifts to the inhabitants. If you know the story of Jim Elliott, uh, you may know a few more of the details of the, the lengths to which Elliott and his fellow missionaries went to try to introduce themselves from a distance to the Iuka people, uh, dropping gifts from, from balloons on airplanes and, and doing uh, all sorts of different things to kind of slowly introduce themselves uh, to the Iuka people. And of course, in spite of all of that preparation, in spite of all of that intentionality, uh, they were met with the same fate. So John knew that it was dangerous, Um, She also shares that he had already started taking linguistic and anthropological notes in his journal. Much of what we know about his last few days on the earth, we know because he kept a very extensive journal. And because he left that behind, they found that. He he specifically mentioned the All Nations uh, Missions Organization because he wanted them uh, to be able to get his journal. And in that journal, he was taking linguistic notes and anthropological notes. He wanted to learn the language of the people. He wanted to understand how their society was built and how their social norms were put together because he wanted to become a part of their society. Now, here's where, uh, even for those of us who never intend 
to go uh, into international missions as a full-time calling in our life, this is a really good insight for us. Because as we seek to share the gospel with people, it always behooves us to, to know those people well. The better we know someone, the better we can reach them with the gospel. You know, I think about uh, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch and how Philip started, not where Philip wanted to start necessarily, but Philip saw that the Ethiopian eunuch had the scroll of Isaiah out. And so he didn't take him back to the Roman road and say, well, listen, this is what Paul talks about. He, he wanted to reach the Ethiopian eunuch where he was. And so he talked about that scroll in Isaiah and, and the one to whom it pointed. And so we would do well to know that we will be more effective in our evangelistic strategies the more we know the people to whom we are sharing our faith. That is a great reminder to us that we cannot just, you know, uh, get inside of our holy huddles and, and huddle up together in safety against the outside world and expect to be successful in our evangelism. We have, to, we have to live among people. We have to know people. We have to understand their thought processes. And uh, John certainly did that. Uh, Stetzer says, in personally talking with some of Chow's friends, I learned that his purpose was to live on the island for years and build a relationship with the people to help them through, uh, to help them through his medical training, uh, to learn their language, and then to tell them about Christ. Let me just go back to that. Here's another thing that we can learn uh, in terms of missions and evangelism. Sometimes it's going to take years. Sometimes it might take days. Sometimes it might take weeks or months, but, but we have to be willing to be in it for the long haul uh, because the results, hopefully, are going to last for an eternity. Uh, so we, we need to learn that from, from John Chow and be willing to pay the price uh, to do things the right way. Now, Stetzer, in reflecting on this, and you've got to keep in mind, Stetzer is a missiologist. He is one who has given his life to not only the study of missions, but the strategies of missions. And so when he looks at the life of John Chow and he looks at this particular story, he does uh, have some, some unique insights as to some things that maybe... Chow could have done uh, a little bit differently. For example, Stetzer says that Jesus sent his disciples out two by two. Uh, he says the Bible has much to say about the importance of teams and community. Of course, he's talking about Luke chapter 10. Uh, in particular, it says in Luke 10, 1, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him two by two into every town and place where he himself was about to go. You know, we've heard the, we've heard the term that there is safety in numbers. Uh, Jesus seems to endorse that. Jesus seems to give us wisdom that when we are doing outreach, when we're doing evangelism, when we're doing missions, um, that, that there is safety in numbers. Uh, Stetzer says teams bring collective discernment and provide a safeguard against unwise attempts at mission, missionary endeavors. And according to uh, one of these ladies, Mary Ho, who was uh, one of the directors at, uh, at this missions organization, All Nations, according to her, there was a team who was willing to go with Chow, but he chose instead to go alone. Uh, so, so we need to hear that. We need, we need to understand that sometimes our own fervency for a particular project uh, needs to be compared and contrasted against what the wisdom of a collective body might say. Uh, I, I think that's one of the reasons that, that I'm so very excited that Southern Baptists have a missions organization in which they uh, commission and send out missionaries, and they, they keep this sort of thing in mind. And we need to be uh, aware of that and learn from that. Uh, of course, one of the things that comes into play is what Jesus says in Mark chapter 6, verse 11, if any place will not receive you, and they will not listen to you. When you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. Uh, you know, Jesus seemed to be indicating that there are places that just don't want the message. And we have to take that into consideration. Uh, he, he says to us, uh, I, think, I think which applies to our personal evangelistic endeavors, not to cast the pearl before the swine, to recognize that there are some people who are just not ready for the gospel. And we have to learn to look for those signals. And I think that's one of the reasons that we have to be so very committed 
to the idea of prayer uh, as it relates to our mission efforts and to our evangelistic efforts. It's one of the reasons that we need to see this as not just a pamphlet that we put in our Bibles, but as an opportunity for us to join with those who have given their lives to go overseas and to share the gospel with people who desperately need to hear it. We, we, we heard a wonderful story this morning uh, about Larry Pepper and the way the Lord has used him and his family. And so I would encourage you, uh, make sure you don't lose this. Uh, use this throughout the week uh, because uh, our missionaries have difficult decisions to make and they have, they have a high cost to pay. Uh, John Chow's first attempt at entering onto the island, he was trying to deliver some gifts and apparently the first time the, uh, the natives saw him approaching their island, they shot at him with arrows. And uh, fortunately for him on that day, one of the islands, I mean, one of the arrows pierced his Bible, but not his heart. Uh, but he had to decide whether or not he was going to come back the next day. And he did. And uh, I don't think that any of us can sit in judgment and say that he made the wrong decision. Uh, it is just a great reminder for us that going on mission is costly. And sometimes there are going to, there's going to be a cost involved, and it will not always go well. Uh, pa Pam Arlen said, John counted the cost. He, he very much knew what he was getting into. He counted the cost. And in the last few hours before his death, he counted the cost again. And he decided that Jesus was worth it. You know, when I read that phrase, when I read, and then this comes from his journal, one of his last journal entries. And in fact, his final journal entry is this. You guys might think I'm crazy in all this but I think it's worthwhile to declare Jesus to these people. And if we learn nothing else from John Chow, I think we need to be challenged and inspired by that statement, by that conclusion, that he knew the risk that he was getting into and he was willing to pay the cost to bring, to bring Jesus to people who desperately needed to hear that message. Now, for most of us, we will never face that particular decision. And most of us will never encounter that kind of cost for sharing the gospel. And I think that is a, 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 a stark reminder for us that the costs that we often think of are not nearly as high as the costs that many people are, are paying. Because going on mission and being a missional people is a costly endeavor. Uh, sometimes it's going to cost us financially, uh, as, as we see during the Lottie Moon Christmas offering season, that we, we, we want to give sacrificially because people need to hear the gospel. Uh, we, we shared at the Jingle Jangle Jam party that we always try to make the Lottie Moon Christmas gift the biggest gift that our family gives throughout the year because there's no gift that's, that anyone needs to receive that's any more precious than the gospel. And so sometimes missions is going to cost us financially. Many times missions and evangelism is going to cost us relationally. You know, when we, when we stick our neck out there, when we take the bold step of talking about Jesus with those who need to hear it, uh, we're, we're not always going to be received well. There are going to be people who think that we're weird. There are going to be people who think that we're arrogant. And, and the more that we get into uh, the changing of the culture around us, there are going to be people that think that we're bigoted and narrow-minded. But regardless of what they think of us, what we think of their need should not change. People need Jesus. And so we need to be willing to pay the cost to bring people to Jesus. Uh, Pam said this of John, John fell in love with a people that he never met. And he loved them even at the moment that they were attacking and killing him. I wonder if we have that kind of love for people. I know sometimes when my family is attacking me, I don't even want to love them sometimes. And I know them pretty well. And I know they feel the same about me. But are we going to love people that well 
to be willing to risk, to be willing to invest, to be willing to change our life uh, because we understand what Jim Elliott said. These were his kind of not famous last words. I don't know if they were his last words, but I, they, they were some of the words that, that he spoke to people in his life that thought he was crazy. He said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And there may be some of you out here tonight, and you need to hear those words as a parent or a grandparent or an aunt or an uncle or just an encouraging friend because there may very well be people in your life that feel called to a mission that you think is silly and too costly for them. A mission that may go against your particular dreams for your loved one. We need to remember what Jim Elliott said. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And not only are there many in here who might need to hear that as a parent or a grandparent, I'm, I'm still convinced there are, that all of us may need to hear that from a very personal basis. One of the reasons that I chose to show the video that we showed this morning is because I wanted all of us to hear the story of Larry Pepper that had this successful career. He was, he was doing his dream job, and yet God called him on mission, and he was willing to go. Even though missions is costly, even though he was going to have to give up his dream job and change his life and move away from the rest of his family, he was willing to pay the price because going on mission is commanded. Even if it's controversial and complicated and costly, being a people who are missional, being a sent people is commanded. I don't need to remind you of this, but I will. Jesus said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Those were Jesus' last words to us. He has given us a mission. He has given us a task to complete. It is commanded. Acts 13, 47, the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. It's a great reminder of our mission strategy from Acts 1, 8, that uh, the Holy Spirit will come upon us and, and He will give us power to be His witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and even to the uttermost parts of the world. No matter where God sends us, we should be willing to go because missions is commanded. And then one final thought as we close together is that going on mission must be covered. And what I mean by that is not... Is, is not mainly financial. Of course, I think it's very important that we give sacrificially to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, but I'm just reminding us again, this is the kind of covering that I'm talking about. We need to be covering our missionaries. We, we need to be praying for them, and we need to be praying what role God would have us to play in what they are doing. But at the very, very least, praying that God would give them safety and, and health and, and, and his guidance as they seek to do a very, very difficult task. Um, I am always amazed at the Apostle Paul and his regular request for prayer. Um, I, I meet with a group of guys on Thursday mornings, and we are just finishing up the book of 1 Thessalonians. And in chapter 5, Paul says to the church at Thessalonica, pray also for me. And, and, and as we sat there and read those words, it was, a, it was a stark reminder that none of us is so spiritual that we don't need prayer. Even Paul. In fact, Paul, I think, goes out of his way to say, I need you to pray for me. Colossians 4.2, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. And at the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ. And so I want us to end our time together by beginning our week of prayer for international missions. Let's pray for our missionaries. Let's pray that God would give them guidance. Let's, let's pray that that one day very soon, 
we can hear a story not about a missionary who was tragically killed, but about an unreached people group who was miraculously reached with the gospel and radically transformed by the life-changing power of the good news of Jesus. So let's pray for him.